You're listening to the Redemption Church Podcast as we go through our study of the book of Acts in a series called A Spirit-Filled Life. Now at Iconium, they entered together into the Jewish synagogue and spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So they remained for a long time, speaking boldly for the Lord, who bore witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But the people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews and some with the apostles. When an attempt was made by both Gentiles and Jews with their rulers to mistreat them and to stone them, they learned of it and fled to Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lyconia, and to the surrounding country, and there they continued to preach the gospel. Now at Lystra there was a man sitting there who could not use his feet. He was crippled from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul speaking, and Paul, looking intently at him and seeing that he had faith to be made well, said in a loud voice, Stand upright on your feet. And he sprang up and began walking. And when the crowd saw that what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in uh, Laconian, The gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Barnabas they called Zeus and Paul Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. And the priest of Zeus, whose temple was at the entrance of the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowds. But when the apostle Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their garments and rushed out into the crowd, crying out, Men, why are you doing these things? We are also men. We also are men of like nature with you. And we bring you good news that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. In past generations, he allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways, Yet he did not leave himself without witness, for he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. Even with these words, they scarcely restrained the people from offering sacrifices to them. But Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. But when the disciples gathered about him, he rose up and entered the city, And on the next day, he went on with Barnabas to Derbe. When they had preached the gospel to that city, they had made many disciples. They returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the soul of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders from them in every city with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Then they passed through Pisidia and came to Pamphylia. And when they had spoken the word in Perga, they went down to Italia. And from there they sailed to Antioch, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work that they had fulfilled. And when they arrived and gathered the church together, they declared all that God had done with them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. And they remained no little time with the disciples. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word, Lord, and we do ask you just to minister to us through this word and through the word that you've given Pastor Daniel tonight. Thank you, Jesus. Speak to our hearts in your name. Amen. Amen. Great reading. And you know what? I just want to say this. Great reading to you, church. I know it's sometimes a lot, like 28 verses is about average, but sometimes there's like 50 verses, and you're like, wow, my attention span is really bad because I just couldn't hold five minutes just reading the Bible. Okay, and so this is actually a part of our practice, <laughs> reading the Bible, understanding this. And so what we do is we don't just read the Bible. We want to understand it. We want to want to study it together and med- meditate on it. The, what the Word of God tells us we're to meditate on it day and night. And part of that is to help us process. Uh, even sometimes as we read it over and over and over again, new things jump up at us, uh, speak to us in different ways. And so what we just read was Paul's first missionary journey. It just completed. Okay, Uh, remember last week was Acts chapter 13 where they were in Antioch worshiping God. And the the word for last week was overflow because they were ministering to the Lord, worshiping God. And out of that, the Holy Spirit sent them to go preach the good news. And my friends, this is good news. You realize that, right? We should be coming into church celebratory. Uh, We should be coming with smiles on our faces, understanding that 
all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, including us. But the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And so Jesus came. God loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And there is no one besides God because he said he was the way, the truth, and the life. You could look to Jesus for hope, for salvation, for forgiveness of sins. There's only one mediator between God and man. And the reason this is is because Jesus went on the cross. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, The Father made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. Of God, And so Jesus would call out and say, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. He would not only die, three days later he would rise again. And when you put your faith in Jesus, the Bible says, you actually become born again. Now, I'm saying all this, that was just some scripture. I'm thinking of Romans 3.23, Romans 6.23, John 3.16, 1 Timothy 5, uh, 2, 5. I think I may have done 2 Corinthians 5. 21. I even forgot like Ephesians 2.8. That's a pretty good one. We're saved by grace through faith, not of our own doing, but you know, let's anyone both. We can keep on going on and on and on. And the Bible gives these pictures of the good news, but in our minds sometimes we think it's a drag. It's a bummer. This isn't a message of hope. And God would say, no, no, no. I'm not a God that's dead. I'm a God that's alive and I, you have a living faith. These things are actually true. They're reality. All spiritual blessings are found in me, and so they're caught up in who God is. They're caught up in who God is, worshiping for this salvation. The Lord is my strength and my light, my salvation. Whom shall I fear? God, this is just who you are. Give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. He's a good father. He's faithful. He's mighty. He's strong, and they're just so just in love with the Lord, and the Lord ministers to them and says, I just, I love you too. I just, I hear, I want to use you. And, and just go and tell other people about it. You realize that what's about, what's taking place is not a vacation, okay? He's not just going to all these cool little cities by Italy and just, oh, look at the view and let's beach there, okay? This is the real deal. And this is what God wants us to do as Christians, to be so caught up in who he is. When we read the Bible, that be a people of thanks to just repent, turn to Jesus, be satisfied in him. And then out of that satisfaction, he gives us calling. He gives us purpose. He actually uses our lives, and it should be this natural flow from our lives of love to the Lord to actually love to other people. We could sum up all these commands and all these verses and, and what we're to do and to love God and love other people. And part of loving other people is telling other people that they can have a relationship with God. It's good news. It's this gospel. And so we should have some joy. We should realize what we're actually doing. And so let's study a little bit. Things are about to get real, people, okay? Now, I haven't done this, all of Acts, but I'm about to. It's a map. That's right. You, you guys may have, if you have like a fancy Bible, it's in the back of your Bible. You may see this. Don't get freaked out, okay? They are cities that we cannot pronounce, and I'm not going to try. But if you actually look at it, Antioch is to the, the starting point to the right, and Paul sails and goes to Cyprus and starts going up to Perga and the city and Galatia and all these places, Derby and like all these places preaching the gospel. And Paul would actually take three missionary journeys, what the remaining of Acts is about, him responding of who God is. And this is some something that we sort of like elevate Paul for, the great apostle Paul, that he actually lived out his faith. Because he knew that his faith was real. Here's what I want you to see from this map. These are actually cities with real needs and real people. And this is the real gospel. And guess what? The, the need for this gospel to be preached today actually makes a difference. You may sometimes think, okay, these are like stories, and I can't really pronounce that name, but what about like the need for the gospel in Delray Beach or in Boca Raton or in Boynton? are in South Florida, are in the United States, are in Mexico, are in Spain, or in the world. Places you may be familiar with. That God has placed you in this moment, in this time, in this generation, to do something that makes a difference, that these times of worship, he'll actually draw your heart, strengthen your faith, so that way you can go and share the love of Jesus with other people. And so I think it's important because, I mean, sometimes even my verbiage, I don't like to call these even stories because we think of fables. But the Bible says we're not to think of fables, we're to think of doctrine and real things, and these are actually events. 
These things actually took place. Uh, and in this chapter, Barnabas and uh, Paul are called apostles. In verse 4 and in verse 14, um, the Greek word is sent one, and Latin translated where we get the word missionary. Okay, So they were in Antioch, this starting point. They were worshiping the Lord out of the overflow. They were sent by the Holy Spirit and through the authority of the church, and they took this specific task seriously because it was from God and from their brothers in the community to go and do this. So much so that we read in this chapter, look at this, this is crazy. Paul gets stoned by opposition, so much so they think he's dead. His buddy Barnabas picks him up. He gets healed while he's getting healed, preaching in Lystra, and then goes back to the cities where the people went and stoned him. That's how serious this mission was. Because, listen, if we're going to be so happy and joyful about heaven, we need to have a serious conversation about the reality of hell as well. That if we're saved by grace, that we all need grace. And if you don't have the grace of God, you are damned. You are condemned. John, the Apostle John in John 3, 36 says, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Heaven is real, and so is hell. And the need for God is great in every single generation, in every single city, in every single community, in all of our lives. And the action that the Bible tells us to is to repent, to turn to God, to receive his grace, that Jesus did this amazing thing, lived a life that we could not live, and he proved to us that he is alive and he is real. And that same need of salvation is real for us. And this is why God, in through the Apostle Paul, writing doctrine to the church, tells us that we are sent as followers of Jesus. Uh, it's not just these people that are sent, these missionaries. Actually, when you follow God, you get called into the family of God. He's given you his spirit, and he has sent all of his believers to go into the world and make disciples. What we would know is Matthew 28, the Great Commission. But Paul would actually write to the church of Rome, in chapter 10, verse 13 through 15, he would say, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Remember, this gospel is for everyone because they've seen that's not just for the Jew, but it's also for the Gentiles, for the, the whole nation. How then will they call on him whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. You remember that Jesus, after the resurrection, would tell his followers, his disciples, Mark 16, 15, go then into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation, to everyone. Don't even have bias. Don't even think, well, they're too far off. No, everyone can receive this, including you and including me. And we have to understand as followers of Christ that God wants to use us to proclaim his good news. This is why our mission as a church is to pursue and to proclaim, because that is a, a, a supernatural pattern, just like suffering and glory in the Bible, just like, you know, re death and resurrection. Like, these patterns are very important that when we love and get caught up in God's love, the natural thing is for us to experience God and then be a witness. The natural thing is for us to enjoy God and then let people know about him. And we don't want to get these things backwards. Charles Spurgeon actually said this about this subject. He said, every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter because we've all been sent. And it is by the grace of God that God matures us and grows us to maturity and to more like Jesus to actually do this. You can't be a fully developed Christian or disciple unless you're actually making other disciples because part of the command was go and make disciples, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them the ways of, my, <laughs> of God. And so if you're not doing that, you're not maturing. And sometimes we need to have a nudge. We need to have a command. We need to have be commissioned. And just as the Father sent Jesus, now Jesus dwells in us through his spirit, and he has commissioned us to go and be sent, to be in this world but not of this world, to preach this good news. And so here's the word I'm given, chapter 14. You may already know it. Evangelism. Evangelism. Okay, now, if you look up the word evangelism in our, the greatest dictionary in 21st century, Wikipedia, don't know how culture changed our definitions, but it did, and it says in Christianity, evangelism is the commitment to our act of public preaching of the gospel with the intention of spreading the message or teaching of Jesus Christ 
It's telling people about Jesus and actually wanting them converted. You're like trying to like, in, in the Bible context, not Wikipedia, there's words like persuade, to turn, repent, to actually change one's mind. We actually want to tell people about Jesus and they will either reject him or accept him. There is new, no neutrality with this message. And for some of us, this is very scary. This is very, very scary because we're introverts. We understand that the gospel is offensive. And when we truly preach the gospel in Jesus, uh, half the people will choose it and half the people will reject it. Uh, it can go either way. Jesus said in, in Matthew twenty thirty, whoever is not with me is against me. And whoever does not gather with me scatters. And so evangelism could be this very scary word because oftentimes it's a very personal rejection. Because the reality is, Robin and I were talking about this in Alpha, Christ lives in us. And so it's not just a message that we preach, it's a person we preach. And that person has done a work in our hearts and now lives with us. So when your friends reject the gospel and reject Jesus, they're also rejecting who you are because you are in Christ. And he is your everything and your Lord and your Savior, your friend. And so it's a scary thing to just go for it and tell people about it. Because it's, it's, it's not a, ah, just whatever. Uh, it's, it's a very personal thing. And you see this even in this chapter. In verse 4, people accepted the message and people rejected it. But the people of the city were divided. They were divided. They had free will. They had choice. They could reject it or, or accept it. And some sided with the Jews meaning they rejected Christ, and then some sided with the apostles. And Paul seemed to understand this in his commission, in his authority, in his leadership, because he would write the Church of Galatia. Um, it's on the map, or it was on the map behind me. One of these cities he would actually visit. Galatians 1.10, he would say, For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. He would say in Corinthians the same sort of thought. He would say, listen, we are like the aroma of Christ, and people that are saved will like love it, and it will be this beautiful incense, and it's, it's like this victory smell, but actually it's a, it's a smell of death as well to other people that reject it. There is a line, and you must choose with evangelism. There is heaven, and there is hell. There is God, and there are false gods. There is Jesus, who says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except me, and you can either believe it or not. So evangelism is a scary word because it brings rejection. It could be offensive. But listen, it's also for some of us, and especially in our culture, it's an offensive word. Because if we say this is the definition of evangelism, not just from Wikipedia, but like from the Bible, well, our culture says, who do you think you say you are? Like, who, who are you to tell me what's true and what's not true? It's good that you're following Jesus, but that doesn't mean, like, I need to follow Jesus. And, in fact, our culture is a lot like that, and it's influencing the church. Barna just did a, teamed up with Alpha, which we've been going through this summer. We meet on Tuesday night, 6.30 to 8. It's been an incredible time, eating a meal together, listening to uh, the Word of God being taught and just talking about it. They, they partnered with, with Alpha and Barna, did this research, um, and Christianity wrote, about it in February 2019. So this is like super recent, okay? Cu just a couple months old. And the article is called this. Half of millennial Christians say it's wrong to evangelize. Half. 47% actually that are born again, that actually think religion is a good thing, love Jesus, say evangelism in our culture is wrong. The, sur the article says, surveys find young believers want others to know about Jesus. They just don't want to speak about it for themselves. Nearly half, 47% of practicing Christian millennials, churchgoers who consider religion an important part of their lives, believe that evangelism is wrong. So what is behind the beliefs that this evangelism is wrong? Barna President David Kimmon points to the rising culture of expectation against judging personal choices. Practicing Christian millennials uh, were twice as likely as Generation X or four times as likely as boomers or elders to agree with the statement, if someone disagrees with you, it means they're judging you. This is what they think. This is people right now that say they are Christians. If we say you are wrong, 
we were actually judging you. Interesting, because Peter says we're to judge the household of God first. But the article goes on, cultivating deep, steady, resilient Christian conviction is difficult in a world of you do you, or don't criticize anyone's life choices, or the feelings first priority that our culture makes a way of life. The president said, as much as ever, evangelism isn't just about saving the unsaved, but reminding ourselves that this stuff matters, that the Bible is trustworthy, and that Jesus changes everything. And see, what often happens in evangelism is we convict and we condemn Christians for not doing that, and it becomes a work-based thing, like we have to do it, rather than, did you know God is so good and other people could know about you? And we've lost our awe of God because we're doing a whole bunch of rules and we're condemning people and just saying, well, just, okay, it's a, if it's a box, then just check. Just raise your hand and then you're done. But that's not following Jesus either. We're saying, change your mind, repent, turn to God. Jesus is salvation, and it's not just a salvation you do once. It's a daily renewal that you, that he is king, that he is Lord, that he is your new reality because he, you are in him and he is in you. But our culture says, well, what's good for you is good for you. and What's good for me is good for me. No, that's wrong. That's biblically untrue. There is right and there is wrong. Th there are absolutes. There is evil and there is good. There is truth and there is lies. And just when people say that there are no absolutes, you can just say, you just said an absolute. What are you thinking? You can't base your life on that. And what did Jesus say? The truth will set you free. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom because he is truth. He is a person. He sets up everything, reality of what we are. And so we as Christians want other people to know about Jesus because he's so amazing, because we are damned without him. Yes, it is a little bit judgmental, but we need God's mercy. And the Bible says we live this time, Hebrews 9, I think it's 27 or 29, maybe 28. Around there, we live once, and then it's appointed for man to be judged. Preach the word, Paul told Timothy. I, I urge you according uh, from Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead. And what did Jesus tell his disciples? Now I have given you the authority, the power, the declaration, the Holy Spirit. You actually can judge. You can loosen chains. You can actually know what's right, what's wrong, what's truth. And we go to God's word and we say, this is reality. And listen, people are dying left and right and in a whole bunch of sin and in a world of mess because they are trying to make their own reality. They are trying to play God. And as believers, we don't come with a judgmental heart. We say that was our reality as well. But God has opened our eyes, and I don't want that for you. And so lovingly, we will do everything to share this love with you. Jesus cares about you even when you reject him. He died for you while we were still enemies of him. And so this is good news. This is good news. And, and I, I'm, I'm tired of Christians acting like the gospel is not good. Where would we be without the mercy of God? Have we gone so caught up in rule-based stuff that we have forgotten the gospel? Like, oh, yeah, well, now I'm good because now I just do a whole bunch of good things. This is not behavior modification. This is a matter of life and death. And we are all spiritually dead without Christ. And these are solid core doctrines of the faith. And when we have this confidence, we will get stoned, we will get rejected, and we will give everything that we can to make disciples and to tell people to walk in this reality. The, the book of Proverbs, people love the book of Proverbs. It, it shows us different pictures of how to walk life and in wisdom and, and how to have a godly life. In Proverbs 11.30, I love this proverb. It says, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and whoever captures souls is wise. New King James says, whoever wins souls is wise. Remember this, this is an old school saying, soul winning. That was a, a book by Charles Spurgeon, soul winning. We don't talk about it anymore. We just come to church, do our thing. I mean, we, we sometimes even like tithe, and we're good. We'll give a hug, we'll pray with one another. But there is so much more than following Jesus than an hour or two hours. It's our entire life. It is our life. And this is the heart of God, that he would humble himself, that fully God become 
man. And so it's crazy to me that we would come with this word evangelism and think so so bad about it because God esteems this word evangelism to evangelize, to proclaim, to declare, to herald this good news. And God calls us to evangelize because it is a wise thing for us to do with our lives because it reminds us of how good this gospel of Jesus is. And it's a loving thing to do to tell people about to experience Jesus' experience, to be witnesses. And so in this chapter, I just want to highlight four quick things for you that will help us evangelize and that could help, that I see that they did that could actually help us today. Because part of our, our being scared of this word is because we're just not good at it. We just never, we don't do it. But you have to practice these things. You have to learn these things. And so we'll go over these briefly. I promise, that introduction, that was like half my message. It was pretty good, you know, it was done. Um, but listen, they evangelize with their words. They evangelize with miracles. They evangelize with their lives. And they evangelize in community. And you can see it right here in the text. If you look at verses 1 through 7, we see that they actually open their mouth and preach. They, they evangelize with words. Now, this may seem obvious, like, duh, but they actually open their mouths. The gospel is a message that Jesus came, died, according to scriptures, rose according to scriptures. 1 Corinthians 15, like we are saved by a saving knowledge of God. In verse 3, they remain for a long time speaking boldly for the Lord. In verse 7, they continue to preach the gospel, herald, declare. Some have said, we'll all just live a life that speaks for itself. Although that helps you preach the message. That is not the message of the gospel. You have to open your mouth. You have to declare it. And having a godly life will actually help you declare it even better, as we're going to see that help Paul. But listen, Jesus lived a perfect life, the, the, the most moral perfect life. But he came down fully God as man, and he was a teacher. You ever think about that? He didn't just, I mean, he was perfect. He was sinless. But he actually opened his mouth too. And he taught, and he preached, and he declared truth. God, he has given us this way to communicate, and it is with words. And so we need to understand the truth sets people free, and we are to declare the gospel. Paul said, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, also to the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith, for faith, for as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. What is faith? Faith is I'm going to trust in someone or something. And when we declare this message, we just say, will you have faith? Will you trust in this message that these things are true about Jesus, that he wants to forgive your sin, that he died, that he rose, that he can bless your life and give you eternal life, all these things. But faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And so we have that authority. We're to declare the word of God to people and let them decide. So open our mouths. This is one helpful thing. Be in practice of how do you share the gospel? What is the gospel? Speak forth the gospel with believers and with one another. The second thing they did, because they're going, verse 3, and then they go into other towns, and other towns, verse 7, they keep on preaching. So they're, they're opening their mouths. It seems like they're going to the city. They're preaching a message. They're going to the city. They're preaching a message. But they also evangelize with miracles. They also evangelize with miracles. Verses 8 through 18, we see this story. They sort of make a pause in the city. And, and, and it acts as like that. It tells you these doctrines or gives you these ideas. Because like in verse 3, it says, the Lord granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But then it like sort of gives you an example. And verses 8 through 18 in this particular city is an example of a miracle of what they did. And we see that this guy had been crippled from birth. So, like, could you imagine? Everyone knew from this city, that dude never walks. He's crippled. Probably because his parents sinned, probably because of him sin, a curse, something, bad luck. But he is done. It's over. He's a beggar. Nada. Verses 8 through 10, that's the situation. And then there's this God that they're preaching, and guess what? He's real. Paul sees that this man has enough faith, believes, and he says, in the name of Jesus, just rise and walk. Well, that's strange because the man actually does rise and walk. So much so 
that the people actually start worshiping Paul and Barnabas as gods. Look at verse 11. This isn't like a confusion thing or a manipulation. They're, they're like, oh my gosh, this is God, you God in flesh. The gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Barnabas, verse 12, they called Zeus and Paul Hermes, Her, Hermes uh, because he was the chief speaker. There it is again. He was speaking. He was performing miracles. And of course, immediately, Paul and Barnabas made sure they knew this was not God because we've already read when someone was speaking and they pro- people, the crowd proclaimed that they were God, they didn't actually, they received the glory. Like, yes, I am. I'm amazing. Remember that Herod and that king? And boom, God took him out. So they're like ripping their clothes. They're like, no, 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 no. We're not God. We're not God. There is a true and living God. And this miracle helped them preach. And this actually has happened many times in the, God, in, in the book of Acts. It started in Acts chapter 2. Literally, uh, the miracle of fire coming down, resting on uh, men and women. They're speaking in tongues. And what does Peter do? Starts preaching the good news of Jesus. Matter of fact, Peter and John in chapter 3, they go to the temple to pray. There's another person, lame, beggar, can't walk. Okay, we'll heal you. All of a sudden, that gets a roar. 3,000 people that day, I think actually 5,000 people, 3,000 or 5,000 people that day get saved because they're preaching the gospel. They use that miracle to actually preach the gospel. Even in, like, I would say the bad miracles, the bad supernatural, Ananias and Sapphira, remember them? Acts chapter 5. They lied to Peter, and Peter's like, oh, you shouldn't have done that. You lied to the Lord. You're dead. And they died, and there was fear among the church, but they realized something very special. God was God, and they were not. And so they used this supernatural work to point people to God, not themselves. And in Acts chapter 5, 12, now many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles. There was supernatural works happening that helped them preach. And most of the miracles in the book of Acts were not done in a church service like this. They were actually done in the public because there would usually be a miracle. Think about it. I think there's only one, like, miracle. And that's like when the guy was, like, listening to Paul. He was talking so much he died. And he resurrected him. And it's like, okay, now you keep on taking notes. Okay? Most of the miracles in the book of Acts are in a public square from a miracle to preaching the gospel. That's the pattern. They actually use the supernatural supernatural work of God. Acts chapter 8, verse 13, Simon, seeing the signs and great miracles performed, was amazed. This was a magician. He was like, you can't fool me. I know magic. I even know demonic power. This is greater. And he even gets saved. Now, why do I say this? Because Paul would write now in 1 Corinthians, one of these cities that he's about to go visit, verse or chapter 4, verse 20, for the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. Supernatural miracles testify of God's amazing power. This is why the resurrection is so incredible to our faith. And I believe God still uses miracles specifically in evangelism to get people's attention, to preach the gospel today. We need to have open doors that only God can do. Because honestly, as Americans, we rely on presentation too much and not the power of God, right? Because we think in evangelism, we have to say the right thing, and, oh, what if I live out that verse or this verse or whatever? You know what's amazing? When you're speaking to someone and God gives you a word of knowledge about that person, that will blow their mind. They'll start listening a little bit more, even if you don't know about things. You know what's incredible? When their family member is sick and you pray for them and they're not believers and you say, it was in Jesus' name, can I explain who he is? He not only can heal you physically, he can heal you spiritually. And this does happen often. It specifically happens in church plants and works where people are going to preach the good news. God will pour out his spirit and he will show people that he is real. And I'm just letting you know, it's a lot easier to preach the gospel when a miracle takes place. It really is. It's, I mean, this is awesome. Like if God, like think about it, you're in the mall, you're just walking, all of a sudden someone gives you that person's name and says, their mother just died, go and pray with them. What? And you do it, and their mother just died, and you're praying with them. They listen to you then. That would be a miracle. And you know what's amazing? When we embrace that God does miracles, specifically in evangelism in this way, it frees us up because now the burden is not just on us, and we have to say the right thing, and this verse and that. How about the miracle that God is already at work in people's lives? And that's why we tell people when they're doing evangelism to start praying for your friends and family. 
Because God can do, he can set them up. He can actually break their hearts and humble them. So that way when you have a conversation, you may not even think it's like miraculous. But you can be saying literally the exact words that they've been praying and longing for. And the Holy Spirit is already working and using you. And you may not even know it's a miracle. But we have to recognize all salvation is a miracle. If God does anything, it's a miracle. And so we need to be people of prayer that accept the kingdom of God does not just consist of talk, but of power. It's a powerful thing. They embrace miracles and they help them preach the gospel. And I believe so should we. And we can pray for miracles, guys. We can pray and ask God, would you work in that person's heart? That is a miracle. And just continually be persistent. Third thing they did is this. They evangelized with their lives. Now remember, I, I made a big deal. You had to speak. But I will just say this. Our lives can either help our message or they can hinder our message. Okay? Our lives can either help our message or they can hinder our message. They evangelize with their lives. Next we see in verses 19 through 23 this crazy thing. You would think there would be a parade for these people. They're healing. Their people are like not walking and now they're, they're healing. It even says in this text that, that there's like supernatural works of healing happening special through the apostles. So like people should be loving Paul because he's preaching this good news. Miracles are happening. Nope. Literally, the Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city. They were so upset, they didn't even go and beat him in their, their own city. They traveled for this. They had their own little short-term mission trip to go and kill this dude. That's how much they were offended by this gospel. So we have these two communities coming and coming over to Lystra, going and stoning him and supposing he was dead. So meaning there was so much blood, he was on the ground, unconscious. They literally felt like he was done. Supposing it was over, they killed him. Mission accomplished. They went back home. But verse 20, but when the disciples gathered about him, he rose and entered the city. And on the next day, he went on with Barnabas to Derby. Okay, we should get healed up. But when they had preached the gospel to that city, as they were healing, they were preaching the gospel and made many disciples. They returned to Lystra and Iconia and to Antioch, the community of where these people were, and they preached the gospel to them. Now, either Paul is super crazy or he's really passionate about this message. Because can you imagine, say if people from Miami and Fort Lauderdale came up here and shot me 20 times, and it was over for me. I go get healed in Boynton Beach, and I'm making disciples in the hospital. And as soon as I can get rolling, I'm taking an Uber down to Fort Lauderdale. I don't even need my car because I may not come back. And I'm going straight to their homes and their community, and now I'm preaching the gospel to the people that just shot me. This is really what's going down here, Okay. This is how important the gospel was to Paul. God didn't just use miracles, but he also used Paul's life to effectively preach the gospel. Because now can you imagine those same people that stoned him? Months later, he's coming now back to them and saying, but God loves you. And I'm here just to sin, send you another message. He still loves you. That sin that you have, try to kill me, you can be forgiven for that. Jesus taught us in John 5, 16, that we are salt and light and that we are to have our faith have works. And when that happens, that men will understand and see and give glory to God. Can you imagine Paul's life to these people? His life helped him preach. He would go into cities and he would take no money. They would reject him. People would beat him. And he would say, but it's real. His life helped him evangelize, and our lives help us evangelize with people as well. When we actually understand and realize, listen, this, this, <laughs> this is no playground. This is a war, and this is real. And, and you can reject me. You can kill me. You can mock me, but the reality is, is God is so real. I'm living for him. I'm, I'm going to wake up early in the morning and, and, and read my Bible and pray before I go to work. Or I'm going to go on a Saturday night with a group of community to just study God's word. I mean, this is like crazy stuff to people. But Paul went on in verse 22, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that through the many tribulations, 
we must enter into the kingdom of God. He would say, no, 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 this is the normal pattern because our Lord suffered. And so do you see people that suffer, but yet they still have joy? That actually preaches a message as well. When life doesn't go the way you wanted it, but yet you can say, but God is still good. And I'm still going to follow after him. And he still saved my soul. And this is still real. Listen, people in the world respect you. Even when they don't agree with the message. Even like me, someone like Gandhi, we know and recognize the name immediately. Don't even have to have a last name. Just boom, that's boom. Even if you disagree with the message, you still respect the life. He made an impact in history. Mother Teresa. Even if you disagree with the message, even if they taught false doctrine, guess what? You respect the life. You listen to what they say because they had such a passion. They lived by what they believed. And this is why Jesus tells us we're to be witnesses because we experience God and it allows us to be a witness. We experience and we share all these things. And so Paul practiced what he preached and when we practice what we preach, do you know that more people will listen to our message? They'll respect our lives and it will help us to preach and evangelize the message. Man, I, I want what you have. I see the joy you have. I see the strength you have. You really believe what you believe, and you've been effective. And people will understand that. Lastly, they evangelize in community, verses 24 through 28. Again, it's, it's the book of Acts. It's reading a chapter. I literally feel like every single week I'm just skipping so much stuff. But yet I'm taking way long to say what I have. So it is what it is. In verse 27, it says, When they arrived in Antioch, now remember there was two Antiochs, uh, Pedicia, um, where they preached the gospel. This was Antioch where they had worshipped, the beginning of their missionary journey. They gathered the church together in Antioch, and they declared all that God had done with them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. They gathered the church and start testifying of all that God has done, and they give this incredible report. Can you imagine? I mean, th- Barnabas, his name is Encouragement, so he's probably a funny guy. He's probably laughing like, yeah, <laughs> they tried to kill this dude. And I, like, picked him up, and I got him, and then was like, and this fool kept on preaching. And can you believe that? Like, I mean, just imagine the depth and the reality of they, like, if you just had this, this interaction, they're doing this on, and this would actually spur the church in Antioch to send them out again. Because this wasn't the first time. This wasn't the only time. This is just the first time. It's usually was the second time, a third time. And they would send more missionaries and more people when we testify it's important practice among Christians that we sometimes forget, it builds our faith and encourages us as we talk about the reality of who God is and what he does. And so they're evangelizing in community. This wasn't a solo act. They had been sent by the church and by God to go and preach this message. And they had been sent, not just Paul, but Barnabas, in community. And when we're in community, it builds our faith and it helps us. It helped this church send more missionaries, but it also helped Paul because when he was stoned, he had a brother to come and pick him up. Hebrews 10, 24, and 25 is probably why it says, and let us consider how to stir one another up in love and good works, not neglecting to meet together is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. I have found that evangelizing with other people in community is a great asset and tool. When we go out and it's two or three or four, if someone's speaking, the other people can be formed. It, it sort of helps because maybe someone asks a question and I don't relate to that question. Then another person can jump in. Or maybe I don't know the answer. Or then other person can share a Bible verse or answer the question. When you're actually evangelizing in, in the community, it helps because you actually get to learn how to share your faith. Maybe you're uncomfortable, but as you see the process and you see people uh, that are strong and been practicing this for a long time, you get to watch them, be comfortable with it, and it's actually quite exciting. The first couple of times when you speak to a stranger or from your friends about Jesus, it's super scary. But then all of a sudden, it's like, well, that wasn't that bad. I'm still alive. Oh, what? look, they didn't beat you up. Maybe, maybe I can do this. Wait, all you said was like, God loves you? That's it? Sometimes we have all this stuff in our head that doesn't, doesn't get us going, but when we see other people going, 
Or when we want to be lazy and not do something, and then Brian's like, come on, man, aren't we going on Saturday night to go pass out flyers before so people can come? Oh, yeah, yeah, we are. You know, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. See, we actually spur one another on in community, and that's why biblically the people that were sent out and preached the gospel and make disciples were always in community. Like, that's why there are local churches. That's where our, there are gatherings, so we could strengthen one another because maybe you don't have that gift of evangelism, but the hospitality and the person that's evangelism can, like, you can invite your friends over, and that person can share the gospel, and guess what? We get to do it together. It's amazing. And so they evangelized in community, and they preached the gospel, and it was a blessing. They opened their mouths to preach the gospel. They used miracles. They used their lives, and they evangelized in community. Um, Paul's first, first missionary journey, pretty epic. In Acts 13 and 14. God wants us to make disciples and tell others about him and his gospel. And listen, rather than stressing and saying you're not doing it enough, I think the best answer for us as Christians is to enjoy God and allow and pray that he would open up doors. This is what exactly the pattern is. I understand that Paul told Timothy, like, you know, evangelize, even though he didn't have that gift of evangelism, like, hey, you got to preach the word, you got to do the work of an evangelist. We're all not gifted in it, but we still have to do it. And rather than being so stressed out about it, and, oh, should we do this, and what about the five steps and all this different stuff, we can actually just go to God, and he can touch our hearts so much that we would want to tell others about him. This is the place where we should be at, that God is so real, he's so good, that, man, I want to intercede for my friends. I want them to know Jesus because he's good. And it's interesting to me because God is such a good God. He always stupid focuses on grace. Like, we want to just do stuff for him. He's like, nope, you only love because I love you first. Okay? Well, then let me just pay you back. Nope. When you get together, just remember all the work I did. It's done. Just remember grace. Remember how much I love you. Remember how good this is. And it's almost like against our flesh. We want to, like, do a whole bunch of stuff, and God's just like, no, just, just worship me. And out of that overflow, out of that love, that's going to be an effective thing. Because if we just did a presentation and we're done with it, we wouldn't experience the miracle. We wouldn't have the solid maturity in the life. We wouldn't be walking in community. we just get out of our checklist and be done. But even evangelism, God uses that to show us his character, his goodness, his righteousness. And so he says, hey, just focus on my grace. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We can all turn to God. We can repent. We can re- confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us. We can allow the Spirit of God to move our hearts, to open up doors, and as we follow Jesus, to be sensitive to the Spirit and just continue to tell others about God. And so we're going to take some time just to sing a song and reflect on the message, take communion. And um, as Justin comes up, I just want to take time just to specifically pray for you that God would give our body opportunities to share the gospel, that we would be open to it. We see this in Acts chapter 4. They prayed, and then God gave them boldness to speak forth the word. And then I would like to also pray for those that um, are your family and friends that don't know the Lord. Um, And I think this is just important to understand, listen, it has to be a miracle of God to save people. And so let's ask God to do that. Let's remember his grace. And we'll just sing one song and then uh, take communion. And if we could, let's sing, uh, God, I look to you. That we can look to God in his grace and, and just ask him to do a work. And so, God, we ask you to do a work. God, first and foremost in our hearts, let us be a people of thanks. Let us walk in grace. Let us understand in humility that you just saved us by your mercy. That we don't deserve your love and your grace. And I pray, Lord, as we come to you now, Lord, that you would just stir our hearts and give us vision. Let us see how you see. Break our heart for the things that break yours, Lord. Help us to preach the word, help us to do social justice, help us to live a life that is for others and generous and just loving people. And God, we we desire, Lord, for those that are close to us, our friends and our family that don't know you, God. We want to be like that woman who begged the king just over and over and over again. Lord, you say that we don't even have to do that with you, that you listened the first time. You've listened to all of our requests. And we know it's your will, Lord, that you desire to save, for you already did a great work that made it possible for us to be saved. So we pray, Lord, for uh, those friends and family that do not know you, God, that you would save them, that you would use us, Lord, as our lives to preach the gospel so they would see you and us, but ultimately, Lord, that you would do that miracle. We thank you, Lord, so much that we can...
pour out our hearts to you, that we can cry out to you. We thank you, Lord, because you did that work on the cross for us. So let us just enjoy your presence. Thank you for this time, this message, your word. Uh, We pray, Lord, that we would all repent and turn to you, that we would look to you, Lord, that you would give us our calling and glorify you, and we would just enjoy you now. We love you, Jesus. May you be glorified in our lives. It's in your name we pray, God. Amen. This is Pastor Daniel Williams with Redemption Church. Thank you so much for listening to this message. You can subscribe to this podcast via iTunes, Google Play, or YouTube, so you never miss a message. The mission of Redemption Church is to pursue and to proclaim Jesus, and we would love to have you partner with us. Feel free to share these messages with your family and friends. And also, if you'd like to donate to the ministry, go to redemptiondb.com. God bless you.